Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. So far on the podcast, I have made an attempt to cover the universal laws. And there are so many different discussions of universal laws in new thought literature, post new thought literature. We've discussed everything, the law of non-resistance, the law of attraction, the law of compensation, the law of forgiveness, the law of obedience, the law of success. There are so many laws. And the more I integrate these laws into my thinking, I have greater success in my life. These laws make up the algorithm of this simulation. We know that what comes up must come down. That's the law of gravity. If we can understand these laws, we can utilize them in a way that helps us to advance and we can use it to be of great service to others. One book we've covered extensively is Working with the Law by Raymond Hollowell. He was just an amazing writer and I sure wish that he had written more than just this one book in which he covers many of these different laws. One of the best chapters in this book is the law of thinking. Whenever he talks about the law, he says you can replace that with God. God is the law. But he covers the law of thinking in a very unique way and I believe that this particular chapter is an important contribution to our understanding of these universal laws. The law of thinking. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23.7 To the average person, life is an enigma, a deep mystery, a complex, incomprehensible problem, or appears so. But it is very simple if one holds the key. Mystery is only another name for ignorance. All things are mysteries when they are not understood. But when we understand life, it no longer appears mysterious. Man is a progressive being, a creature of constant growth, before whom lies an illimitable ocean of progress to be navigated and conquered only by development and culture of his inherent powers. The progress of the individual is largely determined by his ruling mental state because the mind is the basic factor in governing power in the entire life of man. Attention should be given to the predominant mental state for it will regulate the action and direction of all one's forces, faculties, and powers, the sum total of which will inevitably determine many particular experiences and the personal fate. The ruling state of mind is made up of various mental attitudes which the individual adopts towards things, events, and life in general. If his attitudes are broad in mind, optimistic in tone, and true to life, his predominant mental state will correspond and exhibit a highly constructive and progressive tendency. As almost all the forces of the personality function through the conscious mind in one way or another, and as the daily mental and physical acts are largely controlled by the conscious mind, it is obvious that the leading mental state will determine the direction in which the powers of the individual are to proceed. If his ruling mental state is upward bound, that is aspiring, harmonious, and positive, all his forces will be directed into constructive channels. But if his state of mind is downward in tendency, that is discordant and negative, then almost all his forces will be misdirected. It is evident, therefore, that all of the factors which regulate the life and experience of man, none perhaps exercise a greater influence than the ruling state of mind. Mental attitudes are the result of ideas, and these have the origin in points of view. Therefore, by seeking true and natural points of view, one may secure the best and most superior ideas and these in turn will determine the predominating state of mind. We are prone to believe more than we see. The evidences of the senses are the only facts that some accept. But now we shall realize more and more that it is what we believe that determines what we shall see. In other words, believing is seeing. More defeats and failures are due to mental blindness than to moral deviation. If one lived only by physical sight, his world would be very small. It is said of a bug that its world is only as large as the size of the leaf on which it lives, and many times it does not live long enough to consume the whole leaf. With man, if he lived according to the senses, 
the largest sense he possesses would be that of sight. Thus, our whole world would extend only as far as we could see. If we believed in the testimony of our eyes, we would accept many conditions that are not true. For example, if you look down a railroad track, you will observe that at a certain distance, the two tracks converge at one point. This is not true. Have you ever stood on the boardwalk and watched a ship slowly sink into the sea as it sailed away? That ship wasn't sinking. Our eyes tell us falsely. When you are worried over some obstacle or problem, just remind yourself that it may be purely an illusion of the senses, that it may not be true at all according to the law. Did you know that you don't even see with your eyes? Your eyes are like a pair of windows. At the back of the window there is a reflector and this reflector in turn forms an image of what you see and sets up a wave current. This wave current follows along thin wires called nerves. This relays the image back to the brain. Here at the brain it is referred to the memory center. If the picture is a common one, our memory accepts it readily. But if we are looking upon some new picture, some new scene, our memory does not recognize it. And then we must repeat the picture over and over many times until it makes a lasting impression. Therefore, we do not see with our eyes, we see with our mind. Thought is a subtle element. Although it is invisible to the physical sight, it is an actual force or substance as real as electricity. Light, heat, water, or even stone. We are surrounded by a vast ocean of thought stuff through which our thoughts pass like currents of electricity or tiny streaks of light or musical waves. You can flash your thoughts from pole to pole completely around the world many times in less than a single second. Scientists tell us that thought is compared with the speed of light. They tell us our thoughts travel at the rate of 186,000 miles per second. Our thought travels 930,000 times faster than the sound of our voice. No other force or power in the universe yet known is as great or as quick. It is a proven fact scientifically that the mind is a battery of force, the greatest of any known element. It is an unlimited force. Your power to think is inexhaustible. Yet there is not one in a thousand who may be fully aware of the possibilities of his thought power. We are mere babes in handling it. As we grow in understanding and in the right use of thought, we will learn to banish our ills to establish good in every form we may desire. It is our power to think that determines our state of living. As one is able to think, he generates a power that travels far and near. And this power sets up a radiation which becomes individual as he determines it. Our thoughts affect our welfare and often affect others we think of. The kind thoughts we register on our memories or habitually think attracts the same kind of conditions. If we take the thought of success and keep it in mind, the thought elements will be attracted for like attracts like. We are mentally drawn to the universal thought currents of success and these thought currents of success are existent all around us. We will psychically contact minds who think along the same lines and later such minds will be brought into our lives. Therefore, successful-minded people help success to come to them. That is how successfully-minded living is founded. The law of mind is in perpetual operation, and it works both ways. Persons who dwell on thoughts of failure or poverty will gravitate toward like conditions. They, in turn, will draw them people who accept failure and poverty. On the other hand, we can think on positive conditions, on success and plenty, and in the same manner enjoy full and plenty. What the mind holds within takes its form in the outer world. Some think we must deal with two forces, that is to attract the good, we must do away with the bad, but this is not true. For example, if we are cold, we do not work with cold and heat alike in order to get warm, we build a fire, and as we gather around that fire, we enjoy the heat that is extended from it and become warm. As we build up warmth, the cold disappears, for cold is the absence of heat. To be warm, we give our whole thought to those things which tend to create warmth. We ignore the cold in thinking of heat and bring forth heat. Prosperity and poverty are not two things. They are merely two sides of one and the same thing. They are but one power, rightly or wrongly used. We cannot think of plenty and then worry about the unfavorable conditions that may seem apparent. We think about plenty as we think of it, lack its opposite, will become absorbed or disappear. 
all our thoughts must be directed to the one thing which we desire in order that our desire may be fulfilled. Our method is not manipulating two powers, not dealing with good and evil, right and wrong, prosperity and poverty. But as we follow the law of good and dwell upon that which is good, we shall bring to pass all good things. The mind force is creating continually like fertile soil. Nature does not differentiate between the seed of a weed and that of a flower. She produces and causes both seeds to grow. The same energy is used for both. And so it is with the mind. The mind creates either good or bad. Your ideas determine which it is to be created. A farmer who lives in Nebraska and had come from a small farm in Pennsylvania years before never could adjust to using the binder, a machine that cut and bound grain. He had been accustomed to the old handle and cradle and tied his grain by hand. Repeatedly, he said to his friends, that binder will get me yet. He was afraid every time he climbed upon its seat. One day while I was there, his horses ran away with him and he was thrown over the reel into the machinery. Like Job, his fears came upon him. It took just a few years to bring into reality the fears that he subconsciously had entertained and accepted. Our fears can do so much to us that we should be most careful what we fear and worry about. Years ago, when the flu epidemic was raging throughout this country and many were dying from the plague, a newspaper published an item of interest. In bold letters, the heading read, Do not fear the flu. It was the caption of an article written by a local doctor who explained that fear was the greatest enemy of mankind and that it would have a tendency to break down a person's mental resistance and make him more susceptible to disease. The world is realizing more and more that we dare not entertain in our minds any fear lest it come upon us. Whatever we think in our minds must grow. Why do you suppose the farmer goes out to weed his garden and works tediously to eliminate every weed? Because he knows that if he does not clean out the weeds, they will grow stronger and tougher and choke out his crop. If some condition handicaps us, perhaps a weed that must be plucked out, it is important to know that the condition is the effect that we see. It is not the true cause that we see. Dig down deep into the mental storehouse and find out what is the cause. If we cannot discern it, there are others who can. Then weed out the cause by replacing it with the right kind of thought. That is, if it is fear, replace it with courage. If it is a disease, thought, replace it with a healthy thought. If it is a limited thought, think thoughts of plenty. Force some issue whereby we alter or change the trend of the thought. Then as we replace the thoughts that are weeds, they will die of their own natural selves, for such weeds die from lack of cultivation. As long as we allow things to seem real to us, we are putting our energy into it. We are nurturing it. We are feeding it. We are keeping it alive. We are putting our faith into that thing, whether we like it or not. And it must naturally grow for the law of growth is ever working to produce whatever seed we plant. In my college days, I remember how a number of us were taken on a hazing party. It was purely a fraternal affair, so we were to be initiated and branded. When they came to my chum, they told him to peel off his shirt. He was blindfolded and they were going to brand him with the initials of the order. They branded him with the hot tallow from a burning candle. Now you know that tallow dropping from a candle would not burn at least it never did burn me. But my chum was so excited and nervous he thought they were really branding his back with a hot iron. After we returned to our rooms in the dormitory I saw on his back a perfect letter as though it had been burned with a hot iron. Man can impress his thought on formless substance and cause the thing he thinks about to be created. My chum believed he was being burned and thought it so intently that a welt rose on his flesh which lasted for two days. Man is constantly thinking. He can change his thought, but he cannot stop thinking. This thinking power flows in and through him like the very air we breathe. Man's problem, then, is to direct his power of thinking into constructive channels of expression. It is a scientific fact that no power can act without producing some kind of an effect. And by merely thinking, we are continually producing effects. These effects register and record in daily life. When our thoughts are aimless and imperfect, we create for ourselves pain and confusion. This is misdirected energy, now electric energy. When it is misdirected and uncontrolled, develops lightning, a most destructive agent 
Yet the same power of lightning can be harnessed to become a most obedient and useful servant for good. The first question in our self-development is, are we controlled by our thoughts or are we controlling our thoughts? Are we using our thoughts for gain? Are our thoughts using us for a continued loss? Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all things will be added. Heaven is a state of mind. Therefore, heaven is an orderly, disciplined, constructive state of thinking. To gain all things, we must first gain a disciplined, orderly, constructive state of mind. Have you a disciplined mind? Have you any dominating appetite? Are you emotional? Do you vent feelings through impatience, temper, malice, hate, pride, envy, conceit, lies, dishonesty, and the like? Any of the negations as named, if controlling your thoughts, will delay good from coming to you. Anything in life that dominates us, makes us a servant to its dictates, all our weaknesses and our lacks are due to some compelling influence that blinds us and keeps us from what we naturally would receive if we were free in mind to receive them. Man, being a creature of nature, is endowed with the power to overcome all these mistakes, all these evil forces. That power is unfailing in its operation. When used properly, one can master any trial. Nature has no problems she cannot solve. She has no troubles she cannot remove. All her movements are governed by the law of order and discipline. Man can say and do the same if he will pattern after nature. But first, note nature takes no chances there are no ifs and ands or buts but her forces operate under a law if a stone is thrown up into the air it falls back to the ground again the law says so thoughts in our minds are governed by a law with the same exactness mind is the source and cause of conditions in our lives hence it is here that we start to adjust and discipline our thoughts in order to stabilize our affairs the fact that every problem is mental is another reason why we must learn to control our thoughts to determine our lives. But is our problem mental? Let us see. If we desire to gain wealth, we find that it is not a place nor an environment. If so, all the people in one city would be rich and the people in another city would be poor. Wealth is not the result of saving or of thrift. Many penurious people are poor, many free spenders are rich. Wealth is not due to any certain business, for men in the same business are poor and rich alike. It is something within the mind of man that makes the wealth, and that something in the mind of man is the quality and type of thoughts he entertains. Look at nature again. We see she has every movement well organized. A cut flower soon wilts and dies because it has been taken away from the source of its life. If a dog jumps off a barn roof, he lands with a thud and suffers pain for his act. Instinct warns a dog not to take advantage of nature. Does the hungry lion in the jungle roar and lash in an effort to find his prey? Instinct warns the lion to be quiet, to steal carefully upon his prey, to stalk his meal. Have you ever observed how Mrs. Cat will patiently wait for hours for Mr. Mouse? These are samples of organized action that is instinctive in any animal. This instinct must be adhered to by man. This is the organized method, the constructive method. A disorganized method would be destructive and negative. Man must stalk success or any worthwhile enterprise similar to the lion who stalks his meal. Man must work himself up to gain success. He does not fall into it. Just to roar or to shout his statements is not enough. Birds of dollars will not fall out of trees through fright they will more likely fly away. When our ideas are organized, they are under our control. That is, our thoughts are so arranged that they work together as a single unit. Our minds must be controlled in their expressions so that every process of thought will be in an orderly fashion. All action is the result of thought. It determines the conditions of life. And to have better conditions in life, we must first make efforts to organize our thoughts. We wish to gain the best in life, but we do not know how to think correctly. The average person thinks at random. He has no clear design in his mind to which he can frame his thoughts. If he has a design, he does not direct his daily efforts toward it. Most of his thinking is beyond control, chaotic and unorganized. 
This is why disappointment and failure are always near, for they thrive on indecision. We attract only what we think or create. This is the law of thinking. To achieve success, we must think it. We must work it. We must become it. To advance, we must make some effort to rise. To obtain happiness, we must adapt our lives to the law of harmony and order. To rise above any limitation, we must organize our thinking along constructive lines. If a man wishes to climb up a hill, he doesn't sit down at the base of it and pray to the good Lord to lift him, hoping the Lord will pick him up bodily and carry him to the top or give him a pair of wings to fly. The natural thing he does is first to organize his thought. He decides he is going to climb the hill, and then he starts to climb. He climbs steadily, keeping his eye ever on the top. He may find another picking out a better trail. He may wind around. He may slip back a step or two. He may even fall. He may have to stop, to rest, to regain his strength. But as he keeps his thoughts collected and his desire intent upon reaching the top, he will eventually get there. A woman wanted to dispose of her home. She couldn't understand what was delaying her answer. For she had been praying. She said, for some time I asked her, what do you do towards working with the law? Tell me what you did yesterday. Well, first she prepared breakfast for her family. Then she got the children off to school. Then, she said, she always spent 30 minutes with her silence and her reading. After that, Mrs. Jones called her on the phone and they had a lengthy chat, but it was of little importance. Then it was time to prepare lunch. After lunch, her neighbor called her out to see the garden and she stood and talked over the fence for more than an hour. But, I asked, what did you do in between these incidents? Oh, she replied, whatever came to my notice that had to be done. I was busy all the time, but somehow, she added, I have never liked housework. Where did she fail? First of all, she lacked discipline in her mind, except where others demanded it. Her husband demanded it. The school demanded it. So she got off the breakfast and the children off to school on time. You didn't make any effort towards selling your house, I stated. You thought 30 minutes silence would do it. Instead of organizing your time and work, you did just whatever came along. Her housework controlled her. She did not control her time or her work. She saw the truth. She went back home and each day thereafter outlined her work mentally. If she talked with a friend or a neighbor, it was for just a definite time, not any lengthy time. Each day her work was planned so that she would accomplish something toward preparing to sell the house. Several weeks later, a letter came to me in which this woman stated that the house had been sold at a good price and she added, Do you know, I really love my work now. When the day is done, I have accomplished so much more and I am not nearly as tired as before. I am teaching my children to be orderly thinkers. Do you do just whatever comes along? Do you plan your day that something definite will be accomplished towards your aim, your ambition? One type of people we call drifters, the latter type we call builders. A president of an automobile company whose output of cars was 76,000 last year put out more than a million and a half. How did he do that? Each day he carefully planned the work so that steadily his organization was becoming more disciplined and cooperative until they worked as a single unit. He said when interviewed, he planned more than the job required, so he was always assured of reaching his goal. Whether he knew it or not, he was in tune with the law of orderly thinking. If we have any problems, it is because we are not controlling our ideas. Nature has no problems because she is orderly and disciplined. Self-control consists of an organized thought direction. That is, we start out with a well-defined aim or objective, think toward it continuously, not just for 30 minutes, plan our time and work so that we are working steadily toward the goal. We fill our day so full of constructive duties that there is no room for idle chatter or waste of any kind to enter in. This development will enable us to move steadily upward toward success. When all things are in harmony and order, problems will cease to be perplexities and mysteries will cease to be mysterious. Knowledge and understanding will supplant fear and ignorance and that which was invisible will become visible. That which was unknown will become known. Life with its circumstances is no longer an enigma, but a clear interpretation of the law of thinking. We are what we are according to our state of thinking. We attract only what we think or create. Thoughts are things. I hold it true that thoughts are things. They're endowed with bodies and breath and wings. 
and that we send them forth to fill the world with good results, Oriel. That which we call our secret thought speeds forth to Earth's remotest spot, leaving its blessings or its woes like tracks behind it as it goes. We build our future, thought by thought, for good or ill, yet know it not. Yet so the universe was wrought. Thought is another name for fate. Choose then thy destiny and wait, for love brings love and hate brings hate. Henry Van Dyke. So this chapter discusses the concept of the law of thinking and emphasizing the profound impact of our mental state on our life experiences and outcomes. The law of thinking summarized by Hollowell is that we attract only what we think or create. This is the law of thinking. To achieve success, we must think it, we must work it, we must become it. To advance, we must make some effort to rise. What is it you're thinking about? What you think about will increase. This is the mind force that he is talking about. And from this, we can take a few important points. First, the simplicity of life's enigma. Life seemingly complex and mysterious becomes simple when understood. Mystery is equated to ignorance and understanding life dispels its mysteriousness. Secondly, an individual's progress is significantly influenced by their dominant mental state as the mind is a central factor in our human life. This mental state shapes our actions and determines experiences and fate. Third, this ruling mental state comprises various attitudes towards life and events. Broad, optimistic attitudes lead to constructive and progressive mental states. The conscious mind controlling daily acts directs personal powers based on the leading mental state. This chapter highlights that belief shapes perception more than sensory evidence. It cautions against relying solely on physical senses, illustrating how they can mislead optical illusions with railroad tracks or sinking ships. Seeing is described not as a function of the eyes alone, but as a process involving the brain and memory. Eyes are likened to windows with the brain interpreting and recognizing images. Fourth, Thought is described as a tangible force, likened to elements like electricity and light. Thoughts travel extremely fast, influencing your surroundings and are capable of instant global reach. Are you aware of the power and speed of your thought? Fifth, the power of thought is emphasized in shaping your reality. Now, I talk about this literally in every episode, but positive thinking attracts success and health. How many times can I tell you this? Negative thoughts attract failure and poverty. This principle operates universally affecting personal welfare and even influencing others. And finally, the law of mind operates continuously attracting similar conditions to your dominant mental thoughts. Success-oriented thoughts attract success, while thoughts of failure attract negative outcomes. You've heard it before. I've said it repeatedly. If you regularly listen to my channel, you know this is a truth. But are you fully embracing this concept? It is easy to forget and fall into the pattern and trap of the world. The example he gives at the end is organized thinking. If you are able to take control of your thoughts, organize them, plan them out, plan out your day with focus on what it is you truly want to accomplish, good things tend to happen. So take control of your thoughts because you can be in a situation where your thoughts take control of you. Your monkey mind easily meanders and takes you through many different stops. But if you choose right now to take control of your mind, to have disciplined, organized thinking, then you will attract what you think in a positive and powerful way. To obtain happiness, you must adapt your life to the law of thinking. It will bring you harmony and order. Every thought is important. It is a tangible force in your world. If you have any problems, it is because you are not controlling your ideas. He gives the example that nature has no problems because she is orderly and disciplined. So self-control consists of an organized thought direction. You start with a well-defined intention 
aim or objective and you think toward it continuously, not just for 30 minutes in a meditation, not for 10 minutes in the morning, but continuously all the time, what you think about most of the time is the reality that you experience. So fill your mind so full of constructive thoughts. There is no room for idle chatter or waste in your thoughts. And this will enable you to move steadily toward whatever success you wish to accomplish. When your mind is in harmony and order, your problems will cease to be perplexities and mysteries will cease to be mysterious. Life is no longer an enigma. As long as you have a clear understanding of the law of thinking, you can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to The Reality Revolution.